this is Norton Conyers, an extremely complicated house. We are approaching it from the back, which may once have been the front. We're just going to look at one or two rather interesting features that have been exposed recently. This is the east end of the north block, with rather a nice, probably Tudor period doorway. But just beyond here, um, some render came off the wall and exposed this coining, uh, limestone blocks. It looks like the uh, southeast corner of the north block. But there's some interesting features. The tooling here, uh, scapel tooling, that's a very typical medieval form of tooling. Could even be sort of 13th, 14th century, although the block may be reused. And then comes the block containing the present stair. But this has some early features. This window, the hood mould, has a deep moulding called a casement moulding, which again is typically late medieval. But if we turn and go into the house, we'll see it get even more complicated. This doorway has been altered. You can see it from the form of a lintel. It's an L-shaped stone. The stone continues down here. And what this shows, it's originally been a triangular arch, something like this. And the spandrels, the corners, have been chiselled out. On the wall above is old brickwork, but the brickwork has a coating of pigment. You can see that the mortar in between the bricks has been stained red as well. So th this is just in a desire for a uniform, sort of red, bricky appearance of the exterior of the house. So this doorway isn't in the main building. This is in a porch, in an added block. And if we go through, we're going downhill into a passage towards the oldest part of the house. Here's the door to the kitchen, and just beyond is this archway. Now this is very much a fairly grand medieval archway. It's all hidden by plaster and paint, but you have a deep casement moulding, typical of the perpendicular period. It could be anything after 1350. It could be that early. And then again, a hood mould, like the one we saw outside, again with a deep concave, a casement moulding. Difficult to date, because it's almost a round arch. It's segmental, but almost a semicircular arch. It doesn't fit the textbook styles. All we can safely say is late medieval, but whether it's 1350 or even 1500, we're not quite sure. We're now in the day nursery at the east end of the house, at first floor level. And um, this is part of the house, part of the 17th century extension to the east of the medieval hall, probably replacing a detached medieval kitchen. And exposed in the west wall here is this stonework, quite substantial angle blocks here of a projection, presumably relating to a chimney stack below. Whether this is part of the 17th century addition or whether it's part of an earlier kitchen here, we're not quite sure yet. You can see massive blocks here. There's a socket for something later cut in here. Then further up, you can see a section, probably a medieval stud reused with a groove in the side, probably for lap and plaster infill. And then this very substantial 17th century beam. I think we've got a dendro date for this actually resting on top of there. But again, this beam, this looks a bit makeshift, suggesting this is an earlier feature, and the beam, and thus the extension, come later. So the probability seems to be that this is part of the medieval or Tudor house, and then this was extended. Now we're in the head housemaid's room on the second floor at the east end of the house. Some of the walls have been stripped and have revealed some fairly interesting features. Mainly in the east end wall, this fairly substantial beam in the brick wall. At first we thought this might be timber framing from an earlier structure incorporated in the 17th century building. But looking at it closely, I don't think it is. Were there a timber frame building, you'd have expected peg holes and evidence of a post in the corner and braces, and there's none of that. It's simply a beam in the brickwork. And above it, there are two courses of thin flagstones. There are three courses in the middle. It looks as if the beam has dipped a bit and to get a level footing to the brickwork above, they've had to make it up, and bricks were too thick, they've made it up with this, these thin courses of, I think it's a local marl. So it looks as if this beam goes with the wall in the late 1600s. And this window, this Georgian sash window with nice avolo moulded glazing bars, this cuts, chops straight through the beam. You can see it going on on the far side here. The same beam continues. We do know this end of the building has been changed considerably in the 18th century, and there was an upper floor at about the level of this beam. So possibly this beam, although there's no direct evidence, but possibly this beam took 
took the floor joists of the missing sort of attic floor at this end of the house, of which there is evidence in the attic, so in the cupboards, and in various sort of hideaway places. So again, a continuing, very complicated story. This is the clock tower range, a range of um, service buildings, probably from the later 17th century. The whole range used to be two-storied, but we're only left now with the south end retaining its full height. The rest was cut down, maybe in the late 18th or early 19th century. It's a good quality building. You can see from the openings here, red, sandst red sandstone dressings to the door itself, but then there's an opening above, and you see very nice, finely rubbed bricks forming the, the flat-arched lintel. And then there's a series of these panels over doors. Here we have sash windows, which have been replaced. We have this rather nice three-brick deep band, which was at first floor level. And then these openings, again the brickwork has had this um, you know, brick red pigment placed to cover the pointing, as we saw over the doorway of the porch in the house. But here, actually above the doorway, there is a panel which we had hopes might be inscribed or have something on it. It seems to be just plain, but it's brickwork behind, but there's this fine quality plaster with a yellow wash on its surface. Again, all evidence is quite a high status range of buildings. And again, yet another doorway with a similar panel. But here you can see when they put pebble bash on, they've chipped into the original surface of the plaster to, um, to give a key for the new render. Then as we get to the north-east corner of the yard, the, um, the band returns. So there's been a full height range of buildings here. And then they're cut off. There's been an entry in the centre of the north side of the yard. Um, something like the main entrance on the south side of the house because we have these this range of here but this is all restoration this is all fairly new stone you can see the worn remains of the original eroded right back underneath and also the capitals much eroded are the original so there's been quite a smart formal entry at the north side of the yard here but this may all be the post medieval entry to the house we think the original entrance may have been on the opposite side and the whole house was turned around sometime maybe in the 1600s. Here we are to the southwest of the house, and this is the sort of the, the section from which the building grew. This corner is the one, if you like, original corner. On the left is the solar wing, that's the, own, the wing of the owner's private rooms of the original house. But the projecting bit at the end, there's what we call the tower, and then the end of the north block. And then on the right is the, is the, is the south side of the main hall block, which is now the front of the house, but may once have been the back. And then as we walk around to look at this, the obvious features now, those range of Dutch gables are very characteristic. And they're the mid-1600s, but they replace earlier quite elaborate timber framed gables. We can see the remains of inside. And those were added to a still earlier low-pitched lead roof in about 1580. And the, the low-pitched roof is from around 1500. The question is, is this house 1500 or an earlier medieval building? There's evidence of an earlier building being remodelled here, but we don't know quite how much remodelled. But most of the features we see now are post-medieval. These two uh, large bay windows, they're around 1780. Most of the windows are of the same period, but this big hall window here, an awful lot's happened to it. It's been changed, it's been knocked around, but the hood mould above it has the same deep hollow casement moulding we saw over the doorway inside and over that ground floor window in the, in, in the stair block. So that could well be late medieval. And this is the window that lit the high table in the hall. This was the, you know, the, the high end, the, the, the Lord's private end of the hall with his suite of rooms in the wing beyond. Now inside we saw the north doorway of the screen's passage. Only the north end of the passage survived. It was cut in, some, in the 1780s when the new drawing room was made. And the original door, south doorway was somewhere in this area here, where the bay window now is. So we've lost that. But it, it has obviously fallen out of use by the later 17th century, because this present hall doorway seems to be of that period. Although there are some, we can debate for a while on this one. It's one of these features, the more you stare at it, the less things fit. It really gets quite complicated. But there is something fairly new here. If we stand back a bit up and look up at the wall above the late 17th century doorway, 
there some renders come off and we can see the ashlar, the finely cut stone of an earlier opening. Now the brickwork, as we've seen on the other side, has this reddening added to the mortar. So again, you've got this, you know, trying to unify the exterior of the building. But then ashlar dressings of an opening of some sort. But what sort of opening? I can't quite make sense of it. Whether it's maybe a, a sunk panel to take a coat of arms or a high level window, I'm not sure. It does have a sill. Now, the medieval house had an open hall all the way up to the roof, so an opening up there with a sill wouldn't fit with that. But then floors were put in in the 16th or 17th century, then taken out again in the 18th century when the present hall was created. So the whole ho house had a phase with an open hall, medieval fashion. Then it was floored over, there were upper chambers, then they were taken out and an open hall, Georgian fashion, was put in in the 18th century. So it's all quite complicated. Here we're at the southwest corner of the house. We're going to walk north along the west side. So this is the side of the private, the solar wing. And the first thing we see is this massive, massive stack. This, is, this would be um, with the fireplaces on ground and first floor levels to heat the, you know, the ground floor chamber and the solar above. Then beyond, you have evidence of earlier windows in the brickwork. You see the renders coming off here. You can just see the slightly darker brickwork again with the reddening to the joints, then later brick infill here without reddening to the joints. So you know, the, the window patterns have been quite different. So it's a very complicated house. And then this section, which we call the tower, is perhaps the most perplexing bit of the whole building. It was on the corner of the medieval house, on the northwest corner of the solar wing. As you can see, it's plinth, although it's all hidden by render. It's the much higher level than anywhere else in the house. And this contained a series of chambers, at least three floors, whereas the rest of the house had two. And the question we haven't quite answered yet is, is this earlier, is this part of an earlier medieval house, or did it just have a special function and have three floors, whereas the rest had two you know, at the same time? We don't quite know. And then beyond, the plinth steps down again here, and beyond, this is the west end of a north block, which runs east-west across the north side of the house. And this, as we'll see inside, is clearly an addition. On this side, again, more windows have moved. These windows are probably 18th century in their present form, but there were earlier windows. And here you can see the jam of the earlier window, and the same thing up at first floor level above. So the windows have been moved, maybe just for the purposes of symmetry, just moved a metre or so to one side. Now we're inside the base of the tower, and this small room was partitioned off from the library beyond, I think in the mid-20th century, and the gap's just been reopened, and then we've discovered actually one side of an early doorway, and this is it here, in very, in very nicely cut, I think it's limestone ashlar, a chamfer jam with at the base of it a brooch stop. So that is really a, quite a smart feature. This is a high-status opening. The original floor level was here, so we can see the floors have been dropped right down and that's quite bad news for archaeologists because it means the original floor levels and deposits beneath them have been dug out when the house is remodeled later on. Instead of building on top of, they dug down to get extra height for the rooms. So you know, it happened, but it's a bit sad from an archaeological point of view. So this, this doorway, smart as it is, wouldn't have been very tall because the sill is there and the head was there. So I couldn't have stood upright in it. You can see here the lintel has been chopped through. And above it, the wall is stone. Fairly rough local marley stone. And then a bit of brick above that may just go with the present opening. So at some stage, maybe in the 18th century, th this door would have been quite narrow. They've chopped away the northern jam and enlarged the opening, throwing this room in the base of the tower open into the main room in the solar wing, much as on the floor above in the peacock room. They've taken away, at that level, a brick wall directly above us and thrown the chamber in the tower into the peacock what is that the, the, the peacock room the first floor Well, <clears throat> this boarding was discovered when uh, uh, Sir um, James and Lady 
uh, Graham wanted to open up to see if they could put a doorway through here, uh, and uh, they found this boarding. Uh, the boarding obviously doesn't come from here, it comes from another part of the house, although it is amazing with old work like this how very often it does sometimes come from very close to where it um, um, always was. And uh, if it's been reused here, then of course um, it's more likely to have come from close by. In other words, when they were perhaps uh, restoring this room and changing it, uh, that's when they um, took the boarding down and used it for boarding up this door. But of course that's quite speculative. What is very interesting about the boarding uh, is that it's very thin uh, and it has a very beautifully cut uh, joint at the edges, uh, which is like a V. So that there's a V on one edge of the board and a female V on the other, and the two uh, locate one into the other, uh, which is a very expensive technique to do. It's normally also associated with um, rather older timber than what we think this is. Uh, I mean, I have found it when we worked on the presbytery ceiling in St. Albans uh, Abbey, which is um, uh, 13th century. So I don't think this is 13th century timber, but it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting technique. When it's successful, uh, and of course this boarding has all been put back in sort of rather ramshackle way, but when it's successful, it produces an almost invisible joint. So for instance here, where we just happen to have a very good jointing uh, between the two boards, uh, the joint is, is, uh, is, is really invisible. So it was a wonderful means of jointing timber, which was going to be painted, because it didn't look as though it was a series of boards. It just looked like a flat plane. What's always interesting when you open up buildings is what you find behind. And in exactly the same in this case, um, in that we've got the remains here of the not the remains, but evidence here of the original room finish, which was quite big, wide oak um, uh, 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 studs with quite narrow plaster panels in between. Uh, there is some evidence this was, this was an old doorway, and therefore the timbers have been disturbed already. Uh, so here we have a very interesting um, early um, timber with nice chamfered edges which run out at the top here. So that was a, a show timber, so whatever that was, that was definitely seen before. Perhaps in a screen, um, what's also interesting about it is that the chamfers on all four sides, so wherever it was, it was seen on all four sides. We then have a, uh, an elm timber with rounded edges, um, so that looks like that's been used, or one rounded edge anyway. Um, that's been used before. And then we have another oak timber in behind here, which I can feel, but you can't see. Uh, that also has, um, uh, has chamfers on its edge. So even in this one little section of the room here, we've got a huge amount of history uh, from various other places in the house, probably. Mm. If we do it, you may not have to. I mean... This is as far as the hall's reach. Yeah. You see what? So how, from, 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 well, one can easily feel right hand. So how yes. much of this do we have to take off? Well, uh, I mean, if we were going to do it, we would free the board. I mean, I think we would start that end. Yes. And we would then free this end. Yes. There's actually very few nails around here, yes. and I think you'll find these boards will spring out. Yes. You know, just minimally. That should then give us access to cut the nails from the back between the board and the stud, yes. in which case they'll just come away. Uh, if the far side could be opened up... Opened, of course. <laughs> beforehand. <laughs> well, you needn't if you don't want to, but, uh, but it, James, it but might... James, you fancy that the well, other side being opened up? Well, don't, 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 it's no, don't worry. It's just obviously if it was opened up, we'd just make our job easier, but, <laughs> but it's no need to do that. Okay. Um, well, I'm really glad to be here because having seen the photographs I think that uh, they don't do justice to this panelling it's it's really very interesting um, and yes I mean the paint is a an, it's an exciting discovery I love the the liveliness of the painting um, and they as we've said before I mean this is imitating textile wall hangings different qualities um, in the painting 
but very badly in need of conservation. The paint is flaking, it's very variable. The plain green panel here is particularly bad, and I did some tests yesterday. Now, um, it's interesting that the panels with the red are more robust, but I think that we've got perhaps mixed media uh, anyway. I think the areas where you've got maybe distemper paint, perhaps the boards were primed with distemper, it, it feels as if they were. So you've, you've, you've got uh, probably a chalk primer here. And I imagine that the, the fine detailing is picked out with perhaps an oil. So that here you've got the damask, the damask pattern, what you see today is the bare patches where the distemper wasn't protected by the um, oil bound paint of the top coat. So I think uh, it, it's quite difficult when it comes to, to carrying out cleaning tests because I'm having to sort of go between using solvents and water-based materials and I want to be very careful until we've done analysis with, um, I obviously don't want to do any damage to anything that's here. Now, um, the colours, the red, I think it could be vermilion, some of it could be red lead and the rest of it is probably red ochre. So you've got a mix of quite basic colours, but perhaps an expensive one in here as well. The green, I think, similarly, I think it could be a copper resonate green, which is quite an expensive colour. And the red here, you do see, when I was talking about the oil just now, um, and we have to imagine that these panels would have been vertical. And you've got these runs in the paint here. And these areas where if you were brushing a, a sort of oil-bodied paint, you would have the, the, the thicker line at the bottom, the, the medium would sort of settle out, and you've got these little bubbles of um, oil, and perhaps a little bit of resin in them. The green was often traditionally mixed with, with resin. Um, so, yes, I think that that's what's happening here, and it does, it does confirm that the boards were the other way up. I haven't yet done any explorations of what's happening here. I'm taking paint samples of the areas that look the most interesting, but I don't want to, to dive in. When you take paint samples for analysis, you need the, the smallest amount of paint. I'll just, I'll just show you. Um, now, the thing about paint analysis is it is destructive. It's very... It, very expensive to be able to subject paint samples to something non-destructive. So I take a gelatin capsule like this, and that fragment in the bottom of there is a typical sized paint sample. And that will be mounted in resin and polished to reveal the cross-section, which will give us the information, uh, a, a little bit about the media, um, and it will tell us things that will be very interesting. For example, were, was this board painted green? Um, and then later was the red design put on top. And there could be, uh, in the cross-section, you might have evidence of a dirt layer between the green and the red. The thing is, as you can appreciate, with a sample this size, and when you've got paint that's flaking, you, you, the information you have from the place you've taken your paint sample could actually be very different from half a millimetre away. So actually, the more, more samples you can take, the better picture that you have. But it is, it is expensive to do paint analysis, so um, don't want to take more, more than you need. Um, so it's important at this stage in a job, to, be, to, to understand what's going on, it is important to take some paint samples now. But later on, when you're actually doing the conservation work, there are other things that will come to light and other things that you'll need help with in the decision-making processes when looking under the microscope will give you the answers you hope. So um, what, what I've been doing in the time that I've been here, um, I've brought a selection of materials. I've made up some eyes in glass, which is glue from the swim bladder of the sturgeon. This comes from Russia and is soon going to be impossible to get, I gather. Very expensive, very pure. Um, and I've, I, so the, the, the two materials I've been testing are the eyes in glass, and I've made up a, a particular acrylic dispersion. So that you've got a synthetic and a natural. They both work very well 
in the tests that I've done so far. It's more easy on, a, on an inspection visit like this to use the acrylic because here I'm having to keep pots warm for the isinglass. I've got to keep it in liquid form because it gels as soon as it cools. So I did some tests along here. They're not going to show anything dramatic, but at this stage, the conservation is going to involve cleaning and consolidation in one operation, although you'll have to repeat it several times. I mean, the surface is very dirty, but it's also very loose. So what I have to do is I have to take some of this... Um, I'm not going to do it now, but I'll just show you some of this special tissue. This is very, very strong, but very flexible. And all the processes will be done through this. So I, I have to start by injecting some alcohol into the bit that I want to clean and consolidate to break the surface tension. I put the alcohol through the paper, and then either with a syringe or with a little brush, apply the chosen medium, say the Isinglass, through, through the tissue. It will stick, it will hold the paint onto the surface, and then I can repeat applications and also sponge over the surface so that nothing is actually left. You don't want any of the materials that you're using to sit on the paint because they will contract when they dry and pull the paint off. So um, finishing off with rolling over the surface with a swab, bit of cotton wool, a little bit of deionized water, and then just going over the surface of the tissue to make sure there's nothing left on the surface. And you peel the paper away, and you'll see that there uh, should be no paint stuck to it. But what I found yesterday here is that it needs several, several ap applications. The, po the paint is very powdery. It's poor in medium. The wood is very dry and very porous. So whichever treatment is chosen in the end, you, it's going to need several, several applications. And at the same time as sponging the surface to remove the residues of the glue, um, you're also cleaning.